Our topic for study in this session today is the King of the North in the time of the end. I don't know how many sermons you've heard preached on the King of the North in recent years, but I think that probably not very many have been preached because it's not been an easy subject, but we'll work our way through it and see what we can find out. Daniel 11, verse 40, introduces the subject. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him with a whirlwind, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. The question arises, who is the king of the north? Various views have been held and are still held by some Seventh-day Adventists. Firstly, that the king of the north is the papacy with its political f supporters. Others say that it's Turkey. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. Some have said it was the Ottoman Turkish Empire. This was the view of Pastor A.W. Anderson, who wrote a book, Through Turmoil to Peace. As my friend Pastor Jorgensen said, it was a book that created more turmoil than peace. This view taught that the King of the North ended on the 11th of August, 1840 based on Revelation 9, verse 13 and onwards, dealing with the sixth trumpet. Some other views not considered in this lecture this, today and not being promoted now, such as uh, maybe Russia as the king of the north or communist world. Let us look for a moment at the history of what the church has taught on this subject over the years. The history is broken up into three main periods. From 1846 to 1871, we have the first period. During this time, the King of the North was said to be the papal power. There was general agreement on this during this time. James White taught it. Uriah Smith taught it. Uriah Smith applied Daniel 11.45 to the papacy, and you can find evidence of that in his editorial in the Review and Herald, dated the 13th of May, 1862, under the title, Will the Pope Remove the Papal Seat to Jerusalem? The second period, from 1871 to 1952, the King of the North was said to be Turkey. Around the beginning of this period, Uriah Smith changed his views. Remember that he was teaching earlier that uh, papacy was the power. But now he changed his views. And he began to teach that Daniel 11, 36 to 39 spoke about revolutionary France and that Daniel 11, 40 to 45, dealt with Turkey. He wrote up these views in his book, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, published by the Review and Herald Publishing House, of which he was the editor on and off for many years. The problem with Uriah Smith was that he made the mistake that so many others have made over the years. And that is to try and interpret prophecies by looking at newspaper headlines at the time and trying to fit the prophecies into the newspaper headlines. Newspaper headlines usually deal with political events. And we need to remember that political events are not the subject of Bible prophecy unless they affect God's church. If a political event affects God's church in some way, it becomes a legitimate topic for prophetic utterance. <clears throat> but
But if it does not affect God's church in a direct way, it is not the subject of Bible prophecy. God doesn't give Bible prophecy to make us wise concerning political events that will happen on the earth that don't affect his people. Bible prophecy is given to God's people to point out to them what is coming that will affect the church. We should focus on the church when we look at Bible prophecy. And Uriah Smith made the mistake of looking at the political events and uh, talked about revolutionary France and Turkey and wrote it up in his book. James White, who was also editor of the publishing house at various times, advised caution. In 1877, war broke out between Turkey and Russia. And Smith preached on the Eastern question at a camp meeting attended by James and Ellen White. And there the two men clashed publicly over the issue. Uriah Smith got up and preached about his views of uh, the King of the North as being Turkey. And when he finished his sermon, James White jumped up and took the microphone and said, if you want to know what the truth is about the King of the North, listen to me. And he preached the sermon that the King of the North was the papal power. Ellen White rebuked her husband. And when I re relate this experience, I challenge the men in the audience from time to time, how do you take it if your wife gives you a rebuke? James White got a rebuke from Ellen White. She said, what you did was wrong. Your actions will split the church. And we don't want the church to be split and divided by factionalism. However, the situation was not resolved at that time because Uriah Smith had published it in his book and uh, it became a standard Adventist publication and was used for many years, down to about 1952. <clears throat> in the November 15 issue of the Signs of the Times, which was reprinted in the Review and Herald, 27th of November, 1877, James White urged caution. Uriah Smith did not take the advice that James White gave him, and uh, in the Review and Herald of June 6, 1878, page 180, he wrote, We have reached the preliminary movements of the Battle of Armageddon. You can see this written up in the Ministry magazine of November 1967, page 29 and onwards. Why did Uriah Smith's views begin to predominate? Well, the miniature magazine of March 1954 gives us some reasons. In 1798, the Pope was taken prisoner by General Berthier, a French general, and uh, the Pope died in exile in France. In 1870, the Pope lost all temporal power in Italy when the, the papal states were taken over by Garibaldi and united in to form part of a united Italy. The papal states were a collection of provinces in the centre of Italy, north of Rome, where the Pope ruled as the king. The introduction of France, Turkey and Egypt into Daniel 11 made the prophecies seem to be current to the people of those times and thus more interesting and urgent. Parallels with the political events of the time, you see. Smith did what so many others have done to try and interpret the prophecies by looking at the newspaper's headlines of the day. In more recent times, we have seen this being done by Herbert W. Armstrong in his publications. The danger in doing this is that he forgot that prophecy was not given to make us wise concerning political events, but to let us know what is going to happen to God's church.
Political events are sometimes covered in prophecies, but only if they affect God's church, as I said a while ago. At that time, Russia seemed ready to close in on Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul. Smith thought that this move would well lead to Turkey moving its capital down to Jerusalem. Bishop Newton and Adam Clark and others had linked Daniel 11, 40 to 45 to the Ottoman Empire. Many scholars of the day also taught that Revelation 9 spoke about the Ottoman Empire and that Revelation 11 dealt with the French Revolution. Thus it was thought that these two chapters were parallel prophecies to those found in Daniel 11, 36 to 45. Why did Uriah Smith's views become dominant? James White withdrew from the controversy for the sake of peace. Ministry Magazine, November 1967, and E.G. White's counsel to writers and editors, page 76 and 77, tell us some, or give us some insights into that. White did not write out his views as clearly as Smith did. Smith was a very good writer. Smith wrote his books, wrote his views in a book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, which outlasted anything that James White wrote in a magazine. Now, if you have a magazine in your home, you might rip a page off a magazine to help light a fire, but you wouldn't tear a page out of a book. So books tend to last longer in a home than do magazines. And so the book, Thoughts on Daniel Revelation, prevailed. James White died in 1881, while Smith served as editor of the Review and Herald for another eight years after the death of James White. Now, Smith's views became the dominant interpretation until about 1952. Now, the third period in Adventist history. In 1952 to the present time, the King of the North is again said to be the papacy. The reasons for the return to the earlier position can be seen in Ministry Magazine, March 1954, page 24. Quote, Not until the events so confidently predicted did not materialize, and the papacy, instead of having fallen never to rise again, became a decisive influence in international affairs with the resumption of temporal power in 1929 when Mussolini gave the Pope the Vatican City as an independent kingdom separate from Italy. Not till then did Bible students undertake the re-examination of our denominational position on the prophecies. See the Ministry Magazine, March 1954. Note that this quotation dealing specifically with Daniel 11, 36-39 but that which is states is also true about the King of the North as being the papacy. In Ministry Magazine, November 1967, page 26, the statement reads, the papacy is generally held to be the King of the North and Armageddon is understood to be primarily the climactic struggle between the forces of Christ and those of Satan at the end of time. The years between Daniel, between the, uh, 1924 and 1952 were transition years. In a previous lecture, I dealt with the question of Armageddon, and uh, that is a statement from Ministry Magazine that endorses what I quoted to you, said to you in that previous talk. A summary of Uriah Smith's interpretations of Daniel 11, 36 to 30, 45 follows. The earlier verses in Daniel 11 have not been disputed among the Seventh-day Adventists. The disputes have arisen from verse 14 to 29, uh, sorry, Daniel 11, 14 to 49 have been applied to pagan Rome and, and Daniel 11, 30 to 35 have been applied to papal Rome. The discrepancy of presentations begins with Uriah Smith who applied Daniel 11, 36 to 39 to revolutionary France and Daniel 11, 40 to 45 to Turkey. Let's look now at arguments in favor of the papacy in Daniel 11, 36 to 39. 
Daniel 11 is a parallel prophecy to Daniel 2, 7, and 8 and 9. These prophetics deal with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, four successive world empires. Each prophecy adds something more not found in the earlier ones. That is, we see a pattern of repetition and enlargement. Each prophecy ends with God destroying those who attack his people and his church. Hence, we see the judgment and the establishment of God's everlasting kingdom. Today, most Seventh-day Adventist scholars maintain that Daniel 11 follows the same pattern as the earlier prophecies and so see the papacy as the power described in this passage. James White made a strong case using this argument. In Ministry Magazine, March 1954, page 22, quote, the pioneers of this movement, that is the SDA Church, were for the first 25 or 30 years of our history unanimous in stating that papal Rome is the power referred to by the prophet Daniel in these verses. No other conclusion could be reached after a careful study of the literature of the church during that period. Thus the king in Daniel 11 verse 36 refers back to the antecedent power, the papacy, and not to a new power. That is not to revolutionary France, See Ministry Magazine, March 1954, page 23, quote, It is generally agreed among Seventh-day Adventist Bible students that the king of Daniel 7, 24 to 25, and Daniel 8, 25 to 23 to 25, refers to the Roman Catholic power, which accurately fulfills the prophetic symbols. It was the conviction of the committee that when the king is again mentioned in Daniel 11.36 and described in almost identical language, it could not represent a new power like France or Turkey. Note that in Daniel 7.24-25 and Daniel 8.23-25, the papacy is referred to as a king. Third point, the parallels between the wording with other prophecies that clearly deal with the papacy also strengthens this argument. <clears throat> Identical language is used to represent these powers. Note that in Daniel 7, 24 to 25, the papacy is referred to a king. In Daniel 11, 36, revolutionary France did not prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Why don't you let me read that verse to you. Daniel 11, verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, that is, till the end of time. For that which is determined shall be done. Revolutionary France did not prosper till the end of time. It only prospered for a short time and then it was overthrown and a different form of government was installed. The <clears throat> Daniel eleven thirty seven, 37, Uriah Smith taught that the phrase, the desire of women, which we read about in the next verse or so, verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all Uriah Smith said this desire of women referred to the abolition of marriage as a Christian institution during the French Revolution. Many who believe the papacy is the subject have said this is a reference to the celibacy of Roman Catholic priests. However, more recently another interpretation has been put forward due to a study of the original word translated desire. In the Hebrew, the word translated desire is chemda. This word is used in two other places in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 9, 20, when Saul was chosen to be king, and Daniel introduced him by asking, on, on whom is all the desire of Israel, the chemda of Israel? And Haggai 2, 7 
which reads, and the desire, the Chemna, of all nations shall come to the rebuilt temple. This was a clear prophecy that Jesus would come to the temple that they were rebuilding. So there, Chemda is a title of Jesus. It should be noted that the term desire of women refers to what women desire, not to the desire of a man to have a wife. Note, however, that in both previous uses of this biblical word, it applies to a person, not to an abstract idea or institution such as marriage or celibacy. What would woman, women desire? It could be said that every Judean woman desired that she might be the mother of the Messiah. Thus the word Chemdah is now believed by some scholars to be a title of Christ, as is the term the desire of all nations that we find in the book of Haggai. Note that the English Revised Standard Version renders this phrase the one beloved by women. This concept is further strengthened when we have a closer look at the context of Daniel 11, where these words appear. Note the sequence of Daniel 11:37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. The context here has two clear references to deity. The God of his fathers, or any God. And between these two phrases, we have this desire of women wording. To put a statement about celibacy between two statements about God is hardly logical. Rather, it can con we can conclude that this is another parallel passage that speaks in prophecy of how the papacy would, quote, magnify himself above all. Many see in Daniel 11 verse 38, let's read it, but in his estate shall he honour the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honour with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Some see this as a reference to the exaltation of the Virgin Mary. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honour with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Now let's look at verses 40 to 45. Arguments in favour of the papacy in these verses could include the following. The hymn of verse 40 grammatically refers back to the king of Daniel 11, 36 to 39. Note that some say there are three powers in Daniel 11, verse 40, but not all scholars agree that there are three powers, but rather only two. This line of reasoning is not warranted and is not accepted by most Seventh-day Adventist scholars today. They see only two powers, the king of the north, the papacy, and the king of the south the main rival of the papacy in the last days. Bible prophecies point to the papacy as the world power attacking God's people in the last days, as she did throughout the 1260 years of papal domination from 538 to 1798. The end of the King of the North in Daniel 11 verse 45 parallels the fate of the papacy as seen in other prophecies. Let's notice what the verse says. And he shall plant his tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. Daniel 8.25, speaking about the demise of the papal power, says, Yet he shall be broken without hand. Daniel 7.26 that the judgment shall sit and shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it to the end. And Daniel 7, sorry, Daniel 9, verse 27. That determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The margin says the desolator. That means that the power that desolates God's people will be desolated or punished. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8. 
The Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Revelation 16, 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And Revelation 18, 6 to 8, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. Fill to her double. So much sorrow and torment give her. Her plague shall come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. From a study of these verses, it becomes clear that the king of the north who comes to his end and receives no help in Daniel 11, verse 45, will be the papal power. Now let's look at the question that some people raise. What about the expression, the north? Those who advocate that Turkey or some other power is the king of the north look for a power north of Palestine. They point out, that it was earlier mentioned in Daniel 11, the Seleucid power was north of Palestine. The king of the south was Egypt, south of Palestine. In those days, God's people were in Palestine and were caught between two rival powers. However, in the last days, God's people are worldwide, not just centered in Palestine. And the papacy is also worldwide. Prophecy is given to us to alert us as to what is going to happen to God's people, not to inform us about political events, as we said before, that do not affect the church. Thus, the geographical north has no significance in the last days. The king of the north in the Bible stands for the power that persecutes God's people. Let's have a look at some examples of this. Syria. 1 Kings 11, 23 to 25. Reason, or Rezin, was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon. 2 Kings 5, 1 to 3. Naaman's campaign against Israel, or Judah, is mentioned. Assyria, in 2 Kings 15, 25, with tiglath Pileser that we study about in our Sabbath school lessons this week. He took captives, 2 Kings 17, verse 6. Israel was later taken captive by Assyria, and they are in the north. Babylon, Jeremiah 1, 13 to 14. Out of the north an evil shall break forth, the kingdoms of the north. Now, Syria and Assyria would tended to be north of Palestine, but Babylon's not north of Palestine. Babylon is way over to the east. And yet it says that trouble comes out of the north because the Babylonian armies came up the Euphrates River and the Tigris River and then came across Syria and came into Palestine from the north, even though they originated over in the east. The affliction that they afflicted on God's people came out of the north. Jeremiah 4, verse 6, I will bring evil from the north. Great destruction. Jeremiah 6, 1, for evil appeareth out of the north. Again, great destruction. Jeremiah 6, 22 to 23, a people cometh from the north. They are cruel. Jeremiah 10, 22, a great commotion out of the north country. Jeremiah 25, 9, Nebuchadnezzar and families out of the north. Jeremiah 46, 20, destruction comes out of the north. Jeremiah 47, 2, a flood of waters from the north. Jeremiah 50, verse 3, Out of the north cometh the nation that will make the land desolate. Ezekiel 1, 4, A whirlwind out of the north. And Joel 2, verse 20, I will, will remove far off from you the northern army. 
As I said a moment ago, Babylon was to the east, Jerusalem, not to the north, but because of the desert between the two cities, the Babylonian forces traveled northwest up the Euphrates River Valley and then turned south to enter Palestine from the north. And then we'd come to the invasion by the Greeks. And Alexander, he and his army came across from Greece through what is today Turkey and invaded Palestine from the north. Although they came from the northwest, the Seleucids attacked from the north. Pagan Rome came into Palestine from the north. Thus the title King of the North becomes a synonym for the persecutor of God's people. And thus fits the papacy in the last days, as mentioned in Daniel 11, 36 to 45. All right, let's look at the question now of the papacy in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. Who is the king of the south who attacks the papacy in the time of the end? We should look for a worldwide power that is the rival of the papacy. Throughout history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, various powers have been suggested, but as time has passed, one by one, they are no longer considered powerful enough to play the role outlined in the prophecy. Some say Egypt, king of the south, but Egypt is no longer a powerful player on the world scene. We have been advised to be careful when it comes to the speculation about unfulfilled prophecy. It is safer to adopt an attitude of wait and see what will develop. Some good advice along this line may be found in the Seventh Adventist Bible Comedy, Volume 7, page 877. One thing, however, is clear, and that is this. The Daniel 11, 40 to 42, depicts a great war. The language demands it. For example, the king of the north retaliates like a whirlwind with horses and chariots and many ships and occupies many countries, including Egypt. The mention of Egypt in context rules it out as being considered as the king of the south. Everyone is aware that the papacy itself does not have the army depicted in these verses, so we rather look for the nations that, and states that uh, the papacy will influence and control in the last days. These powers have to be, we would say, mainly Western powers, the Western world of Europe and the United States, which we know is mentioned in Bible prophecy in Revelation 13 and countries with large Catholic populations, no doubt. Here we read that in the last days, the papacy will dominate and will be supported by the ten horns who give their power to the beast and reign with her for a short time, said to be one hour in the Bible text. The papacy will emerge as the one superpower in the world and then be capable of enforcing Sunday laws worldwide. This is something that she cannot do at the present time. Daniel 11, 40 to 42, pictures great control over many countries. The papacy will get financial control, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, Daniel 11, 43. Compare economic boycott mentioned in Revelation 13, verse 17. Those who do not have the mark of the beast will be boycotted, neither buy nor sell. In fact, we see the evidence that the book of Revelation is an expansion of the prophecies found in the book of Daniel. Daniel 11, 44. Let's read what it says. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. That sounds to me like Revelation 13, the death decree that we read about in the book of Revelation, which I have lectured about previously in the previous lecture. The papacy will gain financial control over the treasures of gold and silver, economic boycott mentioned in Revelation 13, 17. The death decree and persecution, tidings out of the east and the north troubled him. Since the papacy is called the king of the north, it could be that tidings or news out of the north mean tidings from within his own ranks. This could refer 
to what is happening when the latter rain falls and thousands of faithful <clears throat> people come to see the truth that we present and join us and leave the papal power and other organisations that support her. When the latter rain is fought out, there will be a great multitude of all nations, kindred tongues and people will join us as we read. Faithful people from the, all the various churches and religions worldwide, as thousands leave their former associations and join the remnant church of Bible prophecy, this will without doubt cause the papacy to go forth with great fury and utterly to make away many. Again, we can conclude that the death decree spoken about in Revelation 18.15 is another example of the fact that Revelation is an expansion of the prophecies of Daniel. Then in verse 45, he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. This passage is understood by some to referring to a possible move by the Pope to Jerusalem. When Satan impersonates the second coming of Jesus, one location where he will most likely appear could well be Jerusalem. And if so, it is very likely that the Pope would fly there to meet him. I can imagine he'd be one of the first to get on a flight to go down to meet him. Daniel 11 verse 45 says, Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Most of the prophecies of Daniel and Re many in Revelation end with the destruction of the papal power at the end of the age, and we have already enumerated many of them. Daniel 7.26, But the judgment shall sit and take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it to the end. That determined shall be poured upon the desolate, Daniel 7 at 9.27. The margin reading says the desolator, that is the power that desolates, will be desolated or destroyed. He shall come to his end, and none shall help him. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The next great event then is the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of God's everlasting kingdom. Our responsibility is to make our calling and election sure. May that be the experience of us all. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.